name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, welcome everybody. Y'all can keep, keep getting your bagels to sort of trickle in. I know you can listen just as well uh, as, as you're kind of getting, getting set and getting settled in. I'm going to start, I had a professor in seminary who was, who was very much an introvert, a little cagey, and uh, loathed to sort of discuss what was going on in his interior life. But every once in a while, he would sort of like open the door a little crack into who he was, and he would announce this by saying, okay, I'm going to open up now. So I'm going to do kind of the same thing. I think um, in dealing with these topics, homosexuality and gender identity issues, um, I think sort of my sharing my own experience of coming to the knowledge of the truth in these cases and these issues might be helpful for some of us who may be struggling to understand why, why is this good, what our church, what our Lord has given us as his teaching. Um, I'm from Charlotte. I went to Catholic schools growing up. I went to Carolina for college. Uh, I found myself in an environment that, uh, that very much trumpeted. You know, these things, these liberties, these freedoms that society was beginning, you know, in my childhood to sort of call good. Um, and especially as I got to college, I was, found myself very much swayed by the argument uh, that's, that's often made about those persons who struggle particularly with same-sex attraction. Um, about why would we stand in the way of these people, of these persons doing what makes them happy? Right, that sort of libertarian argument that you know, if it's not hurting anybody, if you can't really point to any harm that this is doing, then why not let them, you know, do what makes them feel good? You know, what leads them to what they perceive as love. This is something that I found myself sort of not explicitly, but sort of internally, sort of won over towards. You know, a sympathy, a, a sentiment of, of permission uh, to allow these people to do what it seemed their natures were were drawing them on towards. I went to seminary, and obviously, uh, as one studies to become a priest, this is uh, kind of an issue. Uh, if you know if a person isn't totally on board with, with what the church is is teaching, you know, regarding these persons, and so luckily, or providentially, I had a number of very good, very qualified, and well learned um, priest formators who were able to have very serious discussions with me and to sort of expose to me the errors in my thinking and the thinking that I had adopted. Um, and so I made you know, great strides to the point where I, I was able to, as, as every priest, as every deacon does before receiving holy orders and assuming a teaching office in the church, I was able to wholeheartedly swear the, uh, the, the profession of faith and the oath of fidelity. I formally recited the Nicene Creed and swore on the Holy Gospels on the altars that I would be a faithful exponent of all that the Catholic Church held, taught, and believed to be true. And I was able to do that with my whole heart, having been utterly won over to the truth of God's teachings, including in this area. When I was preparing for ordination, uh, when we were getting down to it, and we were just days away, the bishop has, has a, a bit of a tradition with the men who are to be ordained soon. And so he brings, he brings the ordinance, he brings their families into his residence, and he, he, he shares a, a very generous dinner with us. And it's a nice chance for us to sort of celebrate you know, the upcoming ordination. And, um, and, for, and for parents to be able to you know, speak with the bishop a little bit, to give him you know, their thanks for the formation of their child and the reception of holy orders. This includes with it, we also, everybody who wants to come to, to the cathedral and, and praise vespers. And so Liturgy of the Hours is something that the seminarian is being formed in, is growing in. And again, I'll be honest, I'm opening up a little bit. I'm not very good at praying the Liturgy of the Hours. I don't think I'm doing a great job with it. I'm going to follow the rubrics and you know try to do it prayerfully as possible, but it, it's not often something that speaks to me, you know, sort of in the moment. Um, I find that it is a source of strength for me and of, of energy as I set, as I you know make that act of consecrating my time to our Lord. Um, but it's rare that like something jumps out at me and hits me over the head. When we prayed vespers with the bishop, though, the reading was from First Peter, and it had this line in it. It says, "By obedience to the truth." You have purified yourselves for a genuine love of your brothers. And this hit me square in the face to give me a realization of what I had been given in seminary. By obedience to the truth, I had been purified to love my brothers and sisters in Christ genuinely. Myself, as I was before subscribing to these erroneous notions, these sentiments that were in fact outside of truth, I could not then truly love because I didn't have truth. That's what we're going to set about doing today, 
is understanding the truth, not just so that we can be right and yell loud, but so that we can love. Having a firm and a total grasp of the truth of who the human person is and of how God wills to fulfill us as his, as creatures created in his image and likeness, as his sons and daughters. By having that truth, we are then enabled in our own lives and in the lives of others to love as Christ loves and to come to the Christian perfection that Christ calls us to. We're dealing with two, um, you know, on the surface, these are kind of similar, um, but two topics that in truth are, are very different. Um, we're dealing with one topic which kind of comes under two headings, homosexuality or same-sex attraction. We're going to talk about those terms a little bit and how we use them. Um, and then we're also talking about uh, what has been sort of labeled um, issues with gender identity to sort of adopt what the secular culture has, has termed these sorts of struggles. Um, I'm going to spend a great deal more time on the first, on same-sex attraction, because it's sort of older in our society. We've been dealing with it longer, and it seems to be a problem of greater prevalence. And the second, um, it's new. The church doesn't have much of a formal response yet, because this is new. Um, but that doesn't mean we're silent on it, right? We have the principles of the gospel that we use to respond to new ideas to see if they, if they fit with the gospel. And so from that angle, I'm going to going to talk about, about gender identity, who, who we are as human persons, male and female. But I'm going to begin with this topic of homosexuality and same-sex attraction. All right, so first we're going to begin, as is good in searching for truth, always we're going to define our terms, okay? Homosexuality, we're going to take this from the catechism. Those of you who are taking notes, uh, the relevant portions of the catechism are 2357 through, I think, the, the next two paragraphs, so through 2359. And so this from 2357. Homosexuality refers to relations between men or between women who experience an exclusive or predominant sexual attraction toward persons of the same sex. Now, to, to use the term homosexuality, this is one of the terms that we need to be careful with because of central importance in understanding this is understanding identity. Who is the human person? And indeed, we see this has been a battle line in how we talk about these issues. One that society has largely been won over to the side of those who, who advocate for the, the sort of liberal, you know, laissez-faire, do as you will as long as you're not hurting anybody else uh, kind of argument, which is an identity that is totally wrapped up in one's experience of one's own sexuality. That agenda divides the world into at least two categories of persons ever expanding as we sort of identify new sexual appetites and inclinations. But basically, those who are homosexual, those who are heterosexual. And in identifying persons these ways, giving them these identities, it seems to separate people out into two paths to happiness. One is the sort of traditional man, woman who finds his fulfillment and happiness in, in, in sexual relationships with persons of the opposite sex. Perhaps that might tend towards marriage and family if, if the person wants to, but not necessarily. Those who are homosexual, according to this description, is a person whose path to happiness here on this earth consists exclusively or predominantly in a romantic relationship with a person of the same sex. So, how does the church rebut this? Our identity is not wrapped up in our sexual appetites. We are men and women. We have been given the gift of sexuality by our God. And that is something that it's a faculty we possess, and it forms a part of how our personhood is fulfilled. But whom we are attracted to does not determine who we are. We all share the same human nature. Same human nature as men and women created in the image and likeness of God, and for those of us who are baptized, beloved sons and daughters of God. It's for this reason I'm not a huge fan of using the term homosexual to describe persons with these tendencies. The church in recent times has, small c church, has, has, been, has been moving towards using same-sex attraction to define, uh, to, to describe persons who, who suffer uh, from this inclination. Because that way a person can't be homosexual, a person can only be someone, you for, sort of force yourself into a tough grammar to explain this. I suffer from same-sex attraction. It's a lot of syllables, but it's precise. And it, 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 it separates out the identity of the person as a beloved son, a beloved daughter of God, from the inclination, the attraction that the person experiences. Now, because we know this is our identity and that we all share the same human nature, 
If we all share the same human nature, we all share the same means of fulfillment. The ways that we are fulfilled, that we are made happy in this life, they come from who we are in our nature. And the part number of, of ways in which you know, we are fulfilled, and we can sort of you know, start to list them out, um, as, as St. Thomas does in his theology. And so we, we point to things like um, you know, the acquisition of knowledge, you know, it accords with who we are as intellectual beings, the, the commission of good works, that who we are as having a will that inclines to good. Um, we seek to preserve our own life because you know, that, that accords with who we are as, as persons, even in the things we share with animals. But one of these is marriage and family life. That which has been written into our heart from all creation. This is a path to happiness, to natural happiness for man here on this earth. And so, because we know that this is a way in which we are fulfilled, this is a standard that we can use to evaluate this new mode of man's coming to happiness, according to, according to acting on same-sex uh, inclinations and attractions. And so this brings up the, the notion of order. All of our actions need to be ordered, pointed, uh, directed toward those things that fulfill us. And actions that, derive, that drive us away from those things that fulfill us, this is where we can, we can start describe, describing things as good and evil. Things are good if they lead to our fulfillment and happiness. Things are evil if they draw us away from that. And we haven't even started talking about divine revelation yet. This is simply from natural reason that we're talking about these things. And so we can say that man's inclination towards marriage and family, when he acts on that according to the rules that are written into our nature about the commitment and exclusivity of marriage, man is acting towards his good, towards his fulfillment in the happiness of marriage and family life. When man does things that drive him away from that, we can call those evil. And there's a whole range of ways that he can act against that. We can include fornication, we can include adult adultery, masturbation, all sorts of misuses of the gift to man of his sexuality which falls short of the good toward which that is ordered. And that's the standard we can judge everything by. And so then having this as our standard, how do we judge homosexual acts? Do they lead men to his happiness? We know by our nature that these things do not lead men and women to their happiness. Well, we'll deal also with a couple of common objections, um, and some that sort of give us a little entree into the conversation that's happening around these things and some equipment that we can take towards, uh, you know, dealing with these conversations about some, some, uh, you know, some, some objections that are often raised to how the Catholic Church discusses this. One that's sort of making its way recently is the notion, God made me this way, right? The, the notion that someone is born with this innate, exclusive, or predominant desire towards a, an attraction for persons to persons of the same sex. And so we, we ask this question, where does same-sex attraction come from? I want to start with what the Catechism says on this, because it gives us an excellent starting point. Catechism says 22, 2357. Homosexuality has taken a great variety of forms through the centuries and in, diff and in different cultures. And the Catechism says also this, its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained. And if we're to take an honest scientific point of view in the current state of things and the research that is being done into the psychological genesis of same-sex attraction, that's really the only honest position that we can come to, is it remains unexplained. There is no definitive scientific proof of where this comes from. One scholar uh, that, I was, that I was listening to in, in, in speaking about this had, had commented about this as, as a starting point. And he says, this is a good, safe, reasonable starting place. It's honest. We're honest about what we know and what we don't know about this phenomenon. He says, in, in kind of looking at you know, our experiential realities of where this comes from, he said, we can point to common correlations um, from causes, things that might be causes or, or um, experiences that will correlate with an experience of, of same-sex attraction, either at that time or later in life. And these can include some things as, as suffering abuse, as pornography, as experimentation of, you know, sort of that one time in college kind of thing. Circumstances, especially, you know, the historical, um, you know, we see this in prisons and in military units, um, you know, perhaps sailors out on a long tour of duty at sea. This behavior starts to sort of crop up in, in those particular circumstances in which men find themselves exclusively with men. And there are even some, this is a continuation of this quote, and this is important, there are even some who experience same-sex attraction as their first and only experience of sexuality. 
if we're going to be honest about understanding the psychological, the psychological origins of same-sex attraction, we also have to admit this as a possibility and, 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 and likely a reality, that there are some persons who, throughout the entirety of their lives, simply never experience an attraction to somebody of the opposite sex. And so, in the person's own experience, this, what, we can, you know, what we can learn from this is it is certainly possible that a person is being honest if he or she says, I feel like God made me this way. I have never experienced an, uh, that ordered attraction. I am a man. I have never experienced an attraction to a woman, but only to another man. We have to admit this, possi we have to admit this possibility that this is a, a way that some persons can experience their own sexuality. Um, now, having said that, I do, I do want to own, add my own anecdotal experience, you know, my short experience in ministry as a priest, but also this, I've found this to be echoed by other priests who have dealt with the same thing. There seems to be, in my own experience, a very high correlation, not a causation, being very precise about our terms here, but a very high correlation uh, between those persons who, who suffer same-sex attraction in that exclusive or predominant form and having suffered sexual abuse, uh, especially as a child. Um, I see this coming up over and over again. And so as the, the sort of narrative in our culture wants to shift more and more towards these persons who experience this exclusively and predominantly from their first experience, I think we also have to be honest about where these things tend to be coming from. And I can, I can tell you that the vast majority of cases that I see, they do seem to result or correlate with, with an abuse that happens uh, in a person's life. Just to kind of you know, round out our, our understanding of where these things are coming from. Now, having said this, sort of our experiential and rational understanding of, of how we're coming to understand these things, I do want to explore the the theologically, is, is it possible to say this, that God made me this way? Is that a theological possibility that we can confess that is, is consonant with our understanding of God as creator? Um, so first, recall that being homosexual, as the, as the catechism defines it, is to experience an exclusive or predominant sexual attraction towards persons of the same sex. Now, to put this another way, it is to have an, 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 a seemingly innate inclination to sin. Because as we talked about the ordering of these things, um, you know, we talk about these examples of how our sexuality can be misused, things like fornication, contraception, they are a perversion of a, of a desire that's otherwise going in the right direction. It's a desire that leads us to the order that we have for our fulfillment. Homosexuality, however, it's the desire itself that is disordered, that leads us away from our fulfillment. And so in our, in our theological consideration of this, we can call that an inclination to sin, an inclination to do evil, to do something apart from the way that our Lord has, has planned for us to be fulfilled, that is sin. And so, to put, to, to sort of sum this up, and to put it back in terms of, did God make me this way? To say this would then be to say that God made me with an inclination to sin. And that doesn't line up with what we confess about our Lord as creator. We know from Genesis, God looked on all that he had made, and he found it very good. Indeed, the Catholic Church, in teaching the greatness of marriage, one of the things that I love to highlight is that the act of conception involves God's creation of a soul. Each time that a child is conceived, that is God creating a soul in that new person, that conception. And so, when God creates, does God create evil? No. God creates good. He creates each and every human person here on this earth to be good. So where does evil come from? And this again is our theology, it's the truth of our faith. That evil comes from the, from the fall, from the first sin of Adam and Eve, which leads to original sin. The sin that we inherit, it's, um, oh, what's the phrase? Um, by propagation, not by imitation. That we receive in our very persons, in our very, in our very bodies, we receive the, the, the transmission of original sin from our parents, from their parents, all the way back to our first parents. That we are all born with original sin. Not because that's how God made us, but because that is the consequences. Those are the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve. Even when this is washed away in baptism, the church teaches that we retain within us concupiscence, that inclination to sin. And so putting this, this claim in, in theological terms, we know that this is impossible, that God made a person this way, that it is God's will to create this alternate path for happiness for a person who experiences an inclination towards those of the same sex. 
Now, this doesn't, this doesn't say that a person is being insincere when the person says, I've only experienced an attraction to those of the same sex. The person, it's very possible, is being entirely honest. But it's important to distinguish this does not come from, come from God's creative act in, in creating that person. It comes from the original sin that is the source of all evil in this world. Okay, another common objection. The New Testament doesn't speak about this directly. This is one of those things that we hear. It's not in the Bible. Or at least if somebody is, is pointing to, you know, sort of a biblical substantiation of the church's position, their first kind of go-to is Leviticus, right? Chapters 18 and 20. Man shall not lie with man as with woman. It is an abomination. And that seems nice and clear-cut, and we can put that on bumper stickers, and, and that gets loud, and press coverage and all that. But then people raise the objection, well, that's the Old Testament, and, you know, God was different back then, right? <laughs> that's a heresy. We're gonna, we can get into that in another talk. Um, the moral law retains its force from the Old Testament, and we'll leave it at that. But it seems that people aren't going to be won over unless they hear these words coming out of the words of Jesus Christ or, or St. Paul, right? Um, and so, you know, these sort of new biblical, biblical scholars will find a way to sort of twist the words of the Greek to, to misinterpret what is being said in, in the New Testament. But if we take a look at these relevant passages, it's very clear uh, that St. Paul in his writings is condemning the actions of, of homosexual behavior. And so first, and probably our biggest one, is from Romans. Those of you who are taking notes, this is Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 27. And so St. Paul here is talking about the consequences of those who committed idolatry, of those who rendered worship to those corporeal things that were not God. And he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And here is the relevant passage. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. You can twist that translation around all you want. It's not getting around the direct, the directness with which St. Paul is speaking about this. And also drawing a, a clear line that, that this comes from sin, that this comes from man's ancient idolatry and the consequences of his sin. Thence comes uh, these, these further sinful behaviors. Second, in, the, in his first letter to the Corinthians, this is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10. Do you not know that the unjust will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor bored prostitutes, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor the greeter, greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And from this we can, we can learn a couple of things. First, that's very clear. Boy prostitutes, that, that tends to refer, it seems, from what scholars tell us, that... Um, it was a practice in ancient um, Roman and perhaps Greek culture for there to be a, a relationship of mentoring, of older men taking a younger boy under their wing, and that mentorship relationship having within it um, a, a content of, of, uh, of a sexual relationship between the two, as that man would, would try to guide this boy in his, in his coming into adulthood and his living and moving in society, that part of the sort of mastery that he had over that boy was expressed in in some of that in a sexual relationship, um, but it also condemns sodomites, which uh, which refers very clearly to uh, to those homosexual acts that uh, that are condemned. Um, I heard Father Larry Richards was doing a talk on this on this section as well, and he also raised an interesting point because it seems like you know nowadays when the Westboro Baptist Church gets up and starts you know condemning these or that class of people to hell. It's really interesting where these fit in in the list of things that St. Paul says are ruled out among those who will inherit the kingdom of God. So fornication, idolatry, adultery, boy prostitutes, sodomites. So we've taken care of those. But look what follows in the very same category. Thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, or robbers. Things that in our society seem to have much lesser rank. But St. Paul is pointing to the universality of grave sin as excluding us from the kingdom of God. Okay, and so we will leave that there for, uh, for dealing with same-sex attraction for now. We're going to move on to gender identity and transgenderism.
Again, there's less here explicitly because this is, this is new. Um, transvestitism has you know, sort of been around in its various forms throughout the very, various cultures, but we've sort of reached a new medical plateau that is allowing us to sort of, let's say, experiment with all sorts of new um, paths. Now, because we don't have you know, any sort of direct um, catechism references or, or statements that have been you know, written in the church's official teaching authority about this, then we simply we use the principles of the gospel, of who we know the human person is, and also I'm going to talk about what we know health to be and health care to be, to respond to some of these assertions of, of this path towards self-realization that those who are, are advocating for this you know, gender identity ideology are, are advocating. So we're going to start with identity. Who is the human person? Just as we started with this um, for same-sex attraction, we want to start with knowing who the human person is. Now, in dealing with this question, the, the aspect of, of our human identity that it seems we should focus first on is the relationship between soul and body. Because it seems to be at the core of those who advance this ideology of, of dissociating your gender from your person, it seems that they've created a split between who one is in himself or in herself and what kind of body I happen to be inhabiting. Right? And so it's, it's the notion that somebody can be born outwardly looking, sort of cosmetically, aesthetically like a male, but then in the course of the years comes to sort of discover that, oh no, it turns out I myself am actually feminine. And there's been some sort of mistake that I got the wrong body. My soul got sort of slotted into the wrong exterior form. And so the, the course that is sort of laid out for this person's fixing this problem involves, uh, you know, principally hormone therapy, it involves uh, what they call gender reassignment surgery. The idea that we're going to fix your, your outward appearance, we're going to fix what your body looks like um, towards the by the means that are at our disposal, so that there can be a greater correspondence towards who you feel yourself to be in that gender, and what you look like exterior. And that's what's sort of advanced as like, how we're, as, as how we're going to fix this problem. But who do we know the human person to be in regard to, to the relationship between body and soul? We're going to do a little throwback to a rather obscure ecumenical council, but one that has a great importance and great weight for us. It's the Council of Vienne in France, early 14th century. Very, very much lesser known, but it's the 15th ecumenical council in the church. Didn't do a whole lot in the way of doctrinal pronouncements, but it gave us one of extreme importance, and it is this. The rational and intellectual soul is per se the form of the human body. The soul is the form of the body. This is a greater specification of the Christian truth that human persons are soul and body together. We are not souls that happen to be plumbed down into, into bodies that were stored somewhere else earlier. But the soul is itself the form of the body. The two are so interrelated that to call a human person a mere soul or a mere body is philosophically reprehensible, I guess we could say, in Christian thought. Conceiving of a person as lacking soul or lacking body is an impossibility. Indeed, this is the trouble that we get into about understanding what happens to us after death, before the general resurrection. Philosophers deal with this, they call it sort of the separated soul. When our soul and body separate at death and the body decays, what do we call the soul? Because it's not really a person anymore. It maintains the identity, it maintains the intellect and, and the will that are immaterial, that transcend bodily death, but we can't really call that a full person because it lacks a body. Indeed, we know the saints are even, they're, they're waiting the fulfillment of all of their happiness. Those who indeed now behold the face of God, they're still waiting on the fullness of their happiness because they have not yet their bodies. It's for this reason that we await with joyful hope the bodily resurrection um, that, that is to come at the end of the age. But we know all this, and this gives us all an insight into who the human person is, that we cannot divide soul from body. We cannot posit that the soul got mixed up and wound up in the wrong body, and therefore that we would have to fix the form of the body to match the form of the soul, because the soul informs the body. Further, from the revelation of our faith, this is an easy one, it's in everybody's head, but to go ahead and say it, male and female, he created them. We know from Genesis the nature of our creation was that we were made in the image and likeness of God and that humans are made male and female. This is who we are. Now, from the perspective of health, again, 
in, in sort of advocating for how we're going to fix this problem, uh, you know, those who are advocating for, for gender reassignment surgery, for hormone therapy, are basically saying your body looks wrong and that's causing you social anxiety and distress. So we're going to fix that. We're going to be able to give you hormones that are going to, in the case of men, it's going to check the growth of your facial hair. Um, it can lead to, um, to development of mammary tissue that you can, uh, that you can grow breasts. Um, it's, it can lead to a change in the pitch of one's voice to make one sound outwardly more like, uh, like a woman, and vice versa. And you know, similar results can be achieved in flooding a woman's body with testosterone for long periods of time. Uh, putting this very crudely, I don't have a medical background or, or a, a deep knowledge of, of what's done in these treatments, but at base, this is, you know, this is the, the physiology that's, that's sought. Gender reassignment surgery then is to put one under the knife and to intrude, to mutilate one's sexual organs, to destroy one's sexual organs um, from being able to achieve their proper function of, of union of marriage and of reproduction for the sake of an outward cosmetic aesthetic appearance that more closely conforms with what one feels oneself to be regarding one's gender. Let's look at these. Do these meet the definition of health, of health care? What is health? Health is the optimal functioning of the organism. In each of these, gender mutilation surgery, it's very easy to see this, what is actually achieved is a destruction of the optimal functioning of, of an organism. Gender reassignment surgery, it in fact destroys one's ability to, to reproduce and to, and to engage in union with, uh, with a husband or a wife. It destroys an organ system. That, organ, that organism can no longer function. It can no longer achieve its, its end, what it was made for, for reproduction. Um, hormone therapy is, it seems to be a little bit more transitory, but indeed it, it seems to accomplish the same thing. Um, even a temporary flooding of a man's body with estrogen, a woman's body with testosterone, is going to so throw into confusion the proper functioning of, of various organ systems um, that we really can't call this health care. You're taking a person who, at least in the, system, the, 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 the systematic functioning of their organ systems, is otherwise healthy, and you're introducing something that is going to destroy that function. And so, from this perspective, we really can't call this health care either. But in fact, this is a physician violating his first oath, first do no harm, right? And so when a person goes to receive these treatments, this is, in fact, what's going on. Finally, to sort of wrap this up and point us forward of, of Okay, what do we do if there are some of us here who have struggled with same-sex attraction, with our masculinity, our femininity, or if we have encountered someone in our lives that has had these particular struggles, what are we to do? And so we're going to start again with the catechism, with what the catechism teaches about those persons who struggle with same-sex attraction, and I think also we're going to be able to apply this by extension to those who struggle with, uh, with gender identity. And so 2359 in the catechism says this, Homosexual persons are called to chastity by the virtues of self-mastery that teach them inner freedom, at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, they can and should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. And so it's important to note that the call to those who struggle with same-sex attraction is in fact no different from any other Christian who seeks to follow Christ. That call is to chastity, that means the use of our sexual gift is to be confined to holy matrimony. Any use of the gift of our sexuality outside of marriage is sinful. And also to Christian perfection. This is the call, the universal call to holiness. That is just as much for me as it is for you, as it is for every person that God has created. God wills all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And therefore, it's important to, to, you know, as we were differentiating, the world tends to want to classify people into two sort of different groups of people, different paths to happiness. In fact, the church has one classification of people by their nature. It is that people were made in the image and likeness of God and therefore have His plan available to them for their fulfillment and their happiness. For those of us who have or will encounter persons who are struggling with same-sex attraction from 2358 in the Catechism, the number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, and so the Catechism confirms what we were teaching about the disordered nature of these inclinations, this inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. 
They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives. And if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross the difficulties they may encounter in their condition. And so things to highlight from this. Persons who struggle with this inclination, they have a particular trial, a particular cross. In this, they are no different than the rest of us. Raise your hand if you do not have a cross to take up daily. This is the call that Christ gives to all. Second, they must be accepted as human persons according to their identity, not as homosexuals, not as gays, not as lesbians, but they are accepted as human persons, good in themselves, despite having a disordered inclination, and so accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity to the particular cross that they bear. And finally, that every unjust discrimination is to be avoided. Note the term unjust there, unjust discrimination. It is good to discriminate between things that are different. And so if it is good for those persons to be, again, we would treat, you know, if somebody comes to us and, and expresses, I'm struggling with this in particular, I'm going to discriminate. I'm not going to treat that person as if he was struggling with, with fornication. I'm going to treat that person differently because he's struggling with same-sex activities. And so I justly discriminate in how I treat and, and help that person. There is just discrimination and unjust. And so we differentiate those two. For those who are struggling in living out their masculinity and femininity, in, in those persons who would be termed having trouble with, with their gender identity as, as the world would have it, I think by extension we can, we can apply some of these same principles of how those persons with same-sex attraction are to respond. Um, again, these persons may have a particular cross to bear, but they have the same call to chastity, they have the same call to Christian perfection as everyone else. Indeed, for these persons who, who struggle either with living out their masculinity and femininity, or who struggle with, with same-sex attraction, having an exclusive or predominant attraction to those of the opposite sex, it's very possible that this attraction may be so severe as to preclude their being able to marry. They're not being able to enjoy that natural good. It's one of the beautiful things about our faith, that we know that marriage is not the only path to holiness. It's why having the witness of those who are in religious life, who have taken vows of poverty, of chastity, and of obedience, of having celibate clerics that model for us um, the eschatological reality, where in heaven they, are, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. But this marks out for us that the path to happiness does not consist solely in marriage, but rather there are other ways by which we are fulfilled and brought into the union of happiness that only wills for us here on this earth. These persons struggling to live out their masculinity and femininity also are to be accepted as human persons good in themselves um, despite the particular, the particular struggle they have, and every unjust discrimination is to be avoided. And so finally, returning to you know, sort of this, this scripture that, that we brought up in the beginning, by obedience to the truth, you have purified yourselves for a genuine love of your brothers. This truth leads to love. In sort of my earlier um, iteration of, of, you know, in college coming to understand um, you know, how these persons are to be treated. One of the things that I think we have to recognize is that everyone who seeks to work with persons who, who struggle with homosexuality, with same-sex attraction, no matter what their, their relationship to the truth of the matter, if they are people who are advocating for these people to be able to live openly, to, to sort of marry in society, um, or we ourselves were advocating for them to return to the truth of who they are as persons, I think it's important for us to understand that both seem to have at base, a motivation that is a desire to help, right? And I think it's important for us to understand that, especially when we encounter people who are pushing this agenda. It's my suspicion that most of these people are acting out of a sincere goodwill, a sincere desire to help. But we see how damaging this can be when it's removed from the truth. And so it's for this reason that we go through all this, that we make sure we understand the truth of the human person and the true path to happiness. Because one who wills to help out of sentiment, but simply says, you know, do, do what you think is good for you, in truth, the path that they're leading them down is going to end in sin, chaos, fear, destruction, death. But rather, we who seek to love in truth, despite whatever difficulties we may have on the front end of presenting this gospel of love, it is ultimately going to lead to that person's light, refreshment, and peace, and the good things that our Lord has for us in this life. And so, recall that the, those of you who, who may be here, who may be struggling with, with these things, recall who you are as a human person. 
You were made in the image and likeness of God. You were made good. You, like the rest of us, are subject to the consequences of the sin of our first parents, the original sin which visited all the evils uh, the world experiences on us. And so each of us deals with, with inclinations that go in the wrong directions, that don't lead us to the happiness that God wills for us. Um, but realize that at base you are a person who was created good and who has a path for happiness uh, that God has marked out for you. Know that you are made good. For those of you who are baptized, you are a beloved son, you are a beloved daughter of God. Your home is in the Roman Holy Catholic Church, the Bride of Christ, which he gave himself for to make her holy and spotless and undefiled. And so the path towards whatever healing, whatever um, comfort and peace that you desire, it is found here in the truth of the gospel. And so be not afraid of whatever sacrifices that you may need to offer up in union with our Lord's sacrifice on the cross, just like all of us Christians have to walk the same path. You know that the path towards peace and holiness for you is the very same, and it exists here in the church, which is the source of salvation.